Marvel and DC Comics are known for superheroes, but sometimes they dabble in the spooky. So stay tuned and let me show you off some of my favorites. Watch this video until the end. And we're back. My name is Taylor. This is Taylor Talks Comics. And for 31 days in October, I have successfully put out a new video about a different horror comic every single day. This is the last of them. I figured I'd go out with a big one, showing off a lot of different cool books by Marvel and DC that I feel like fit into the horror genre. Some of my favorites that I own. Please give the video a thumbs up and comment down below. Those things help the YouTube algorithm put my video in front of the people's eyeballs that don't know my channel exists. And subscribe if you haven't. I'm on the road to 3,000 subscribers and I need your help. Um, I'm trying to get there by the end of this year. Spread my videos around, spread my channel around, especially anywhere you see someone talking about horror comics. I've got a lot of content on that now. Um, I do have a playlist showing all of my horror comic videos that I've done out, that I've shown that I've done this month so far. So first off, I'm going to hit some that I've already talked about this month. I'm not going to go over in, in depth to them, and it's going to direct you to the videos that I've done. But I have talked about Swamp Thing. I've covered all four of the Absolute editions that DC has put out, which is the Len Wein, Bernie Wrightson. Absolute Swamp Thing, and then the Alan Moore Absolute Swamp Thing Volumes 1, 2, and 3. Um, I have a video on each of those volumes if you want to check that out. Now, if we're talking about Swamp Thing, next I would direct you to the run that follows up Alan Moore's run is Rick Feach doing it, um, the writing on his own. So Rick Feach was one of the artists that worked with Alan Moore during his run. We had Rick Feach, John Tuttlebin, Alfredo Alcala, and Stephen Bissett. Um, we're the main artist on Alan Moore's run. Rick Veach is the one that takes over. DC just now recently put out this uh, trade paperback. A little bit on the thicker side. Um, and it collects the first half of Rick Veach's run. Now, Rick Veach's run did in, in a controversial way. Um, it was issue number, I want to say 87 or 88. I always forget the number. Uh, but he was having uh, Swamp Thing go through the story arc where each issue he was going back and... Uh, meeting somebody from a different um, era of history. And then, I guess, in the controversial issue, he's going to meet Jesus, uh, like actual Jesus Christ, a as he's being crucified on the cross. And DC nixed that and said no. So um, in in kind of a protest of, of creative freedom, Rick Veach left the run and left... DC Comics from there, uh, and then I think it was Donald Moore, maybe, is the one who took over after that, and then eventually Nancy Collin takes over. So, we have never had the end of, um, and I'm not, I'm not even just talking about that issue, we never had the end of Rick Veach's Swamp Thing run collected anywhere. Uh, there are, there has been a petition, there are rumors from Rick Veach that he's willing to do that issue now, today, he's still an active cartoonist, that he would be willing to write and draw that issue to conclude his run and have it collected somewhere. I think that'd be amazing. I would hope that would happen in like an omnibus or absolute edition. Uh, but if it happens in trade paperback, I'll be the first one to pick it up. But Rick Feach does a great job following up on um, Alan Moore's run. Also from DC Comics, um, and more specifically Vertigo, is I Zombie. Uh, it was a hit CW show. But before that, we had this great comic from Chris Roberson and Mike Allred. Mike Allred is one of my all-time favorite cartoonists. This is a really beautiful omnibus edition. You can see the end papers are just total brains. But Mike Allred is, is definitely my number one favorite comic book artist that's active today. Um, and he does almost the entirety of this run. Now what's cool is, as an indie comics fan, if, especially if you're... If you know my channel and things, you know some of these cartoonists that I've got to name. Is that the fill-in artist for the issues that he doesn't do? We have Jay Stevens, who did uh, Dwellings most recently, amazing cartoonist. Jay Bone, who did a lot of, uh, I think he did work on, I want to say Statics, but he's also done a lot of the covers for like the Silver Age and stuff, Silver, Silver Age omnibuses for uh, DC. Jim Rugg of Street Angel fame, and Gilbert Hernandez of Love and Rockets fame. So, when I'm not the biggest fan of fill-in artists typically. I like to have the same artist throughout the entirety of the book. But those four are some really great uh, fill-in artists to have on this run. And um, 
just look at these covers too. They did so many, th like it seemed like Mike Allred, cause this was a two year run, it lasted like about 24 issues. It seemed like, this is not Mike Allred, I think this might be Jay Bone on this issue. But it seemed like Mike Allred was just having a blast, just doing all this, it, it, like, it, it's a modern story, <clears throat> but it has like a lot of these tropes of like classic horror flicks from like the 50s with zombies and things. And really, really a fun story. It's way different than the CW show, I will say, but you can't go wrong with this. This was just recently reprinted um, by DC Comics. So you can seek that out if that interests you. Um, let's finish off the DC with Dead Man, the Dead Man Omnibus. Uh, so I don't have, there's kind of a trifecta of these DC horror omnibuses. Uh, there's like, there's Dead Man and then there's Spectre and there's Phantom Stranger that they've come out with. Now they're not like, none of the stories mat line up or anything. It's just that those three characters typically pop up a lot of times when you're doing DC horror stories. All three of those characters show up in the Swamp Thing run by Alan Moore, for instance. Uh, but the three omnibuses they're kind of like in fandom where we talk about how they're kind of a trilogy of omnibuses, even though they're not exactly related. Um, now I don't have the specter or the Phantom Stranger. Phantom Stranger's on the way, actually. I've ordered it. I'm just waiting for it to come arrive. But the specter omnibus is supposed to be reprinted next year. I'll be adding that to my collection as well. Um, which is the reason why some of these omnibuses won't show up. I do want to hear in the comments, your favorite horror stories from Marvel and DC. Uh, maybe I just don't have them in my collection. Maybe I need your recommendation and that kind of thing. So this is the Dead Man Omnibus. This is being reprinted um, soon. Really, really beautiful design on this one too. You have uh, really cool book and papers. I love this. This is like kind of the the Eisnerian title lettering that will that Neil Adams would do sometimes. So this is Neil Adams' early work, and he was really starting to innovate comics um, from the get go. So Neil Adams, like his Batman run, is really uh, a high water mark in comics. That people talk about a lot this predates that and this is really neil adams working out a lot of his ideas and what makes his comics innovative back in the back in the day when neil adams was back in neil adams heyday um he was being talked about and credited with having a very real like realistic style his comics looked like they were like real illustrative art um that mimicked like photographs or what they would really look like the same kind of comparisons that um, decades later, Alex Ross would receive when he was doing like Marvels and Kingdom Come. This is what people were saying about Neil Adams back then. Now, I prefer Neil Adams' artwork because it still maintains that level of comic bookdom. Um, it still feels like it is of a piece in comics, even though it's like that illust illustrative um, style that is looks like it's you know photographs or whatever. But there's still like a comic book energy to it. That I like, and especially when you have the uh, CMKY colors on top of it too from back then, that helps that look a little bit too. But also, the panel layouts that Neil Adams was doing was really, really innovative back then too. As you can see throughout here, like this is this was on the racks with other Silver and Bronze Age comics back then uh, that were typically working with a four panel grid, six panel grid, nine panel grid, and Neil Adams was starting to break from that and do these more innovative layouts. So this is a really, really a fun run to read and look through. Um, I can't recommend it enough. And you can't go wrong with Neil Adams' artwork. This also has a lot of Jose Luis Gar uh, Garcia Lopez, who's one of the most underrated artists in comics, I believe. And then up next I have The Monster Buses by Jack Kirby. I love these books. Um, I just recently had to hunt down volume one, but now I have them both in my collection. Um, I do love that Marvel even went to the uh, lengths of changing up the spine a little bit. It doesn't say Omnibus on the on the, the top. It says Monster Bus. And I really love that. Um, so these are the pre like these. This first volume predates Silver Age. So this is Jack Kirby when he came back to Marvel in the fifties. Like the first story is the nineteen fifty six, and then nineteen fifty eight is the next stories. And I believe this concludes, yeah, so this first volume concludes right before the birth of the Fantastic Four, where Marvel's Silver Age is known for, right? So this is all Jack Kirby's horror comics from before, this first volume is all the horror comics before Fantastic Four was born. 
And this is when superheroes still weren't very popular. Like DC still had Superman and Batman going, but Marvel didn't really do much um, as far as... Um, sorry, Marvel didn't do much as far as superheroes goes. Like they had Captain America, Namor, and the Human Torch back in the early Golden Age, but they were kind of dying out at this point. Like even like Captain America was like a horror host of a comic. It wasn't even like he was a main character. Look at all these giant monsters. Um, so this is when they're still, this is one of their more, most prominent, uh, genres was sci-fi and horror. And this was also a time when we were getting into like the atomic horror stuff where like early night, early 20th century, like, look at this taboo. Um, a lot of the horror we got in America was the kind of gothic stuff like Dracula, Frankenstein, that kind of stuff. Well, after the World War II, when we dropped the atomic bomb, uh, people started to work on or consider these fictional ideas of like the atomic bomb messing people up and warping people, turning into monsters, that kind of thing. Here's where you get the uh, first appearance of Group 2, by the way. So that's what kind of sparked a lot of this science fiction and horror back then was a lot of these giant kaiju monsters and things. And space travel is a part of it, too. So that all predates the uh, first, the debut of the Fantastic Four. And then we get into Volume 2. And this continues on through there, which... Look at these end papers, too. But just, or not end papers, but title papers. So this is August 1961, which is the month that Fantastic Four came out. All the way through until... Well, 1970, there's some stories from the 70s, but really 1962 is when they end. And they throw in some covers and things that Jack Kirby did um, in the 70s. <clears throat> but before that, so it's like, this next volume is just a couple years, which is crazy that this is truly, for the most part, four years of work from Jack Kirby is in these two volumes. Not to mention that a lot of this volume, he's still doing Fantastic Four and Thor and all these other things. Crazy stuff. Guy had an insane output of comics. So this continues on with that idea. Uh, but this, like I said, this is when uh, Marvel has already created Fantastic Four and Thor and Spider-Man and Doctor Strange and those things. Uh, so they're still continuing on with those ideas, but they still... Also, like, you think about the birth of the Fantastic Four. That first Fantastic Four story reads like a one of these stories, one of these monster stories. I love that transition panel. It's amazing stuff. Jack Kirby is just a master. I, 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 every time I read a new Jack Kirby comic I've never read before... It just puts a huge smile on my face. Like, he's a constantly... No one had an imagination like the King. Absolutely incredible stuff. But so I love these books because these are like the un, unsung heroes of Jack Kirby comics. You don't get, hear people talk about these once enough. Which is understandable. When, when, you, when you're the guy that created things like the Fantastic Four all the way through to like Dark Side and the Fourth World and stuff. It's easy to forget the... Uh, one and done stories that you did. Here's Ghost Rider, Epic Collection, Volume One. Volume Two did, did just come out this week. I haven't got it yet, uh, but this is Volume One of the, these Epic Collections. And this is '70s Marvel horror, which is a genre that I'm really, or which is a decade of Marvel that I'm really, that I really love because it's kind of like an outlaw period, I call it, because the '60s were all done with. Um, Stanley overseeing everything and kind of having control over everything, writing a lot of that stuff. By the 70s is when Stanley started going on his tours of, of talking at colleges and he was in LA and Hollywood trying to get a lot of the Marvel stuff um, made into movies and animation. So he was hands off. So a lot of the editors kind of had a handshake deal with the other editors when the book, because this was also a period when people were able to edit their own stories. Uh, but, like, it was like Roy Thomas would go to Steve Gerber and say, hey, you edit my story, quote-unquote, and I'll edit your story, and we just won't change anything. And that's kind of like the deal that they had. Uh, so there's a lot of, like, just outlaw zany things that are happening. This is also a time when um, the Comics Code Authority was starting to become more lax. Uh, I talked about the Comics Code Authority, Authority a lot on my channel. But so you started to get a lot of this horror stuff come back into comics. So you got, like... A Tomb of Dracula, which I don't have any of in my collection I will show off today, but I want to desperately re read that. It's, there's no reason it's not in my collection or on this video other than the fact that I don't own it. Um, but you get like Frankenstein, they do zombie, all this other stuff. Uh, Morbius would come into the front. I'm trying to think of other ones they would do. 
I don't know. But Ghost Rider was another one. Oh, Son of Satan was a big one, which he takes, he shows up in some of these too. But like this artwork too, just Jim Mooney and, and Mike Plug with his artwork is so cool. There's a lot of cool innovative layouts in here as well. And just like really cool artwork. But the crazy thing about this <laughs> this book, you know, in this period of Ghost Rider is how much of satanic there like culture there is a satanic i don't know what to say themes and ideas throughout here and i can't believe that this was considered okay for children but some of the ec horror stuff in the 50s was not i don't i don't understand it at all but one thing that does fascinate me is like the satanic panic culture or movement i guess and so like reading some of this just kind of reminds me of that and like if a parent were to actually sit down and read find out what little mikey is actually reading they'd probably freak out um, but I just love this artwork too. Like, how can you not love a, a giant guy, a guy with a skull with a giant, like that's on fire riding a motorcycle. Like that's such a cool concept. He's such a cool character. And these were such a blast to read. Um, so I'm excited to get volume two. I've never read, th this was the first time I read this Ghost Rider material. Um, and then also I'm going to get into the Danny Ketch era of the nineties. I have that first epic collection, but I've never read that as well. So I'm excited about that. And then last but not least, we're going to go to Steve Ditko. So Marvel released, like I just showed you off, the uh, Jack Kirby Monster Buses. They also released two volumes for Steve Ditko from that same exact era called the Masters of Suspense. These are beautifully designed books. You can see that they, they still maintain the omnibus tag right there, but the volumes one and two. And these are done in the same fashion where this first volume... I believe takes place in the same exact era. Oh, this goes all the way to December 61, but it starts in April 61. Wow. No, that's not right. I was going to say there's so many more pages. 56. So 1956 to 1961 is where this first volume takes place. And these are Steve Ditko doing horror and suspense stories. So Steve Ditko and Jack Kirby were very, very different uh, minds and cartoonists, which is why I'm kind of glad that they separated the two. Although this tech right here looks kind of Kirby-esque in my opinion. Uh, but Kirby would err more on the side with his horror, more on the side of like science fiction, more on the side of like the creepy, grounded uh, kind of things, or even this like the out there um, spiritual things that you would get for like with Doctor Strange and things. So these read more like Twilight Zone episodes to me. And they're all done, in, like they're all like four to eight page strips, largely written by Stan Lee. But so they're like, if you're into EC comics, like this, these are definitely up your alley. And Steve Ditko was a master cartoonist, so you're never going to go wrong with any of this artwork. But um, truly fun stories that are just like, again, four to eight page strips. So you can just sit down and read a few of them and then move on. Uh, have a by, by your bedside. I'm into horror anthologies and EC comics and creepy and eerie magazine. I've showed those all, all off this month. And this is right in that same wheelhouse of these. And then volume two... I believe, look at these papers too. These were beautifully designed too. I, I have a lot of, uh, a lot of things I say negatively about Marvel's book design, but these monster buses and Tales of Suspense stories or Masters of Suspense are really well designed. So this is 1961 all the way through to 63. And that's when the, these anthologies really started to die out for Marvel. They went like just gung ho and full on with superheroes like that. Does that not look like Peter Parker? Man in the Sky, this is a famous story, too. Tad Carter. I think he's uh, considered one of the earlier... Yeah, he's one of the... If people that like consider the uh, mutant the mutant history of Marvel consider Tad, Tad Carter as maybe one of the first mutants that Marvel ever had in their stories. I do love that they have some of the letters pages in here, too, so you can see what people were saying in the uh, real time with these stories. But it's really, really beautiful books. I can't recommend them enough. So that's it, though. That's my horror options from Marvel and DC that I like. Please let me know yours. I want to hear your thoughts and your concepts and ideas of what Marvel and DC have done in the horror genre. I know they've done a lot more. I just don't own them. So I need to hear about those. But thank you guys for watching. It's been a tremendous October. I thank you so much for being... If you're a new subscriber, I've had a lot of new subscribers this month. Thank you so much for giving me time of day to uh, show you off comics and talk about comics with you guys. I appreciate that so, so much. And uh, please share my channel. Please like and subscribe and comment down below with all your thoughts. Let me know what you plan on doing for Halloween. Uh, I will probably be doing this again next year. I really had a lot of fun with the 31 Days of Horror. 
But now we're done with horror. So now what's the next content? Don't worry. I've got a lot of content planned for you guys in November and December. So stay tuned, subscribe, hit the bell notification icon, and keep talking comics. <laughs>